It is time now for our Reporters Rewind. It is our chance to take a look back at the stories that made headlines this week. To help us digest some of those stories, we're joined at the round table by Kim Kane. She's a writer and radio personality at New York's Power 105 FM. She also hosts a weekly public affairs show. Hey, Kim. Also with us is Amara Jones. Amara is the economics contributor at uh, Color Lines magazine. And of course, we have our very special guest host here, Arise News anchor Jeff Koenengi. I feel like part of the furniture already, you know that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're just one of us. You're part of the family now. Uh, you know, and this has been a big, this has been a big few weeks of news, uh, and certainly this one has been a big one too. Boston still, uh, I think, heads uh, dominates the headlines, and now all this new information that uh, that has come out. So let's see, Kim. Let's start off with you. We've heard sure. that the the brothers' original intent was to strike New York, perhaps on the Fourth of July. How'd you react to that? Right. You know, I mean, at, at, at this point, as we continue to get more information, it's kind of like nothing surprises me. Um, and as far as how our listeners responded, a lot of our listeners lived through 9-11. So, you know, not to compare one tragedy to another, but New Yorkers are really resilient in the way of, I mean, my husband watched the Twin Towers fall. Uh, so I think it's something that just changes the way that you live. and. Um, I just hope that we continue to be vigilant and in getting information. You know, one thing that I don't like is that if, if you see something, say something, the commercials as a mm -hmm. broadcaster, when they continually air those on our airwaves, it just, it just kind of makes me uncomfortable because I think it encourages people to live in a state of fear. Yeah, but also, you know, it really has been public involvement that, that helped sure. kept, catch the suspect, so there is some value to it. Uh, Amara, of course, we learned this week that uh, uh, Johar's three friends helped him with disposing of, uh, uh, of some of his property. When you heard that, what did you think? I thought they were dumb teenagers. I mean, I think, that, <laughs> I think one of the things that's really important in this case is for us to take a giant step back and not to overreact. It seems very much as if that this is much more like Columbine or much more of a case where you have a set of teenagers or very young people who got the wrong idea in their head and had enough time and concentration and organization in order to be able to carry it out. And so we need to make sure that we don't turn this into an existential threat, that we don't turn this into something that causes the nation to bend back on its most cherished ideals because some young people went off the rails. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we just have to be very, very careful. As a friend of mine said um, once, you know, I don't worry about my three-year-old, I worry about my 14-year-old. And I said, why? And they said, that's because Teenagers have all of the capacity of an adult and none of the judgment. And so I think that that's one of the things that we need to be careful about in evaluating this. And this was just yet another, when the lawyer of these 17 year, or you know, 18, 17 year old 19, kids were asked, 19 year olds, yeah. were asked, um, they said, well, we didn't really think that there was anything wrong. I mean, how many times mm -hmm. if you were 17 or 18 or 19, someone would come to you and say, oh, I'm in trouble and your natural instinct is to help. One other thing that's really important as well is that you know, the minds of men, scientifically, I think this came out last year, don't develop fully until they're 25. Oh, that's the excuse you're going no, with. There's no excuse. Tamara Lynn, there's no excuse. I want to push no back, back a little no bit excuse. On, on your thing, because mm -hmm. it, it's not like Johar asked them to hide a bag of weed because his mother was coming to the, the yeah. dorm room. I mean, there was a manhunt for bombers. Yes. And so it wasn't just being the stupid teenager. But people at that age do dumb things all of the time, sure. and dumb, that's horrible things. Dumb. Dumb, mm -hmm. horrible things. Horrible things. This was a horrible act. Um, so, but Mara, that you don't even think that it should rise to the level of a, a terror investigation, which it is? It clearly was a terrorist incident, but the question is whether or not it is a work of an international terrorist organization bent upon destroying the United States. And there's yet so far, and we're still learning, but yet so far, there's no evidence of that. This is someone who was 20, who dropped on the margins of society and went off the rails and took his brother with him. But, Kim or Mara, don't you think there could be many others like these out there. Isn't that the scariest thing? There could be other Johars out there, other, sure. other kids I think, like I think this. there's bad people everywhere, and I think that's, that's a reality. And again, you know, earlier when I mentioned the if you see something, say something campaign, I think it really, um, it, it, it kind of plays with people's psyche a little bit, because if we're constantly living in this state of fear, I mean, I just don't think that's how we were meant to live. Mm. How did you this know? play overseas? Well, being Kenyan, we watch marathons because we know a Kenyan is going to be in the top three. You know? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's so, in the contract that a Kenyan win, right? So we watch the race. And the first, you know, couple of hours, 
you know, the, the Kenyans finished two hours before this incident. Right. So when we heard the breaking news, it was like, I thought we just watched that race. Yeah. Mm. You shocking. thought the race was over. Yeah, it was long over, you know, by two hours and change. <laughs> and the Kenyans had gone home and everyone was concerned. But the, 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 the fact that they would attack a place like this, a race like this, it was, well, it was very touching. It, it is horrible. mind-boggling. Horrific pictures. Mm -hmm. And while you have the table, Jeff, mm. I want to get your perspective on the Syria story. You know, this <sighs> civil war has been going on for two years yeah. now. The yeah. violence is escalating, the use of chemical weapons. And I have covered civil wars in my time. And I tell you, mm. the Syrians must be feeling like the whole world has abandoned them. Mm -hmm. Everyone's left them. I mean, 70,000 people dead in two years. If that happened somewhere else, there'll be, it'll be an outcry, an outrage. Mm -hmm. But every single day, we see another bombing, another airstrike, some more you know, kids being maimed and killed. And very little seems to be done about it. I mean, what's it going to take? I mean, the fact that we watch every day and we sit and we do nothing, for the most part, I know stuff is being done that we don't know about, mm -hmm. but it's still not enough. And civil wars are going to scar people for decades. I have seen this. You know, there, there are three nightmare scenarios for the United States in the Middle East. One is a war with Iran. The second is the collapse of the Saudi, or Saudi regime, the House of Saud. And the third is a disintegration or a civil war in Syria. And that's because it then becomes a proxy war for score settling amongst all their neighbors. If you look at a map of where Syria is, you can see why this is a strategic disaster. I mean, one of the interesting things to me, as you said, things haven't gotten any better. And so it's really clear that the only country in the world that's capable of getting involved and at least tamping down the tensions, even if we can't resolve them, is the United States. And us holding back um, isn't making the situation better, it's exacerbating it and making it worse. I'm glad you said getting involved and not liberating. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't well, you know what, Kim, <laughs> let me ask you about this, because, of course, you know, the president in comments, uh, particularly when he went to Israel a, a month or two ago, made very clear statements about where the red line was as it relates to the use, use of chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. Now we've discovered they did use them. We believe the Assad regime did use them. And then at his press briefing this past week, he seemed to sort of redefine mm -hmm. the red line. Mm -hmm. Did that strike you at all? Well, it, it struck me a little bit, but I think that there's going to be, you know, whatever the president does, I think there's going to be debate about that. So, I mean, I think he definitely has the right to change his mind, and I think that we're learning more about it every day. But this game so. changer thing they keep talking yeah. about, you know, the game yes, seems to be changing every day. Yes, he said that the use was going to be a game changer. This is the game changer, weapons. chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take? Right. And they're testing. I mean, the regime has tested mm. these boundaries all year long. They're pushing right? that on First, the it was don't move them. There yeah. were some incidents of movement, and that didn't happen. And mm. so now they're testing small usage of sarin on a, on, on a small scale to see what the reaction is. And if you're willing to use ballistic missiles um, on your own people and to, smatter, to smash certain neighborhoods, the use of chemical weapons isn't that far behind. It's not a big step. But, but entering Syria really isn't just a, an issue that centers on Syria alone, where mm. the U.S. is concerned, because we. We also have to think about Iraq and what led us to Iraq and how we have taken a decade to get out. So unfortunate as that situation is, it's not an isolated issue. You have to look at it from this decades-long perspective. Well, I think you either get involved or you don't. You know, there's no in-between. Yeah, and especially in posts. Syria. Yeah, yeah, and perhaps some of the criticism that has uh, come upon Bush is because there's a, seems to be there's a little in-between right now. Mm. It was, it was, we had, he hasn't said we're not going to do anything. Yeah. You know, he did say we might do something under these conditions. Now yeah. the conditions happen, so we'll see. I want to move along before we run out of time and talk about one of the other big headlines this weekend, and that was Jason Collins coming out of the closet, the first active member of a prof major professional sports team uh, coming out. What are your thoughts? I mean, for me, what is interesting is how the closet is increasingly a parody of itself, right? <laughs> I mean, at one point it was used to be protective and was seen as a smart move, and increasingly it's not. I mean, if you can serve in uh, the United States Armed Forces um, and can st still consider to be a warrior and to be a man and to be gay, then why can't you be an NFL player who makes $5 million and say that or you're an gay? NBA player or an NBA player. Because there's endorsements on the line. There's, there's contracts on the line. That's right, but then that seems, uh, that then reduces the gladiatorial idea of an sure. athlete. If the fact is that, well, the only reason why I won't tell the truth about myself, right, because this is really about truth telling. It's not mm -hmm. about anything other than completely being yourself and being honest with everyone else. Um, then, um, because I'm afraid I might lose a contract. Well, there are some, well, there's, yeah, yeah there's an economic yeah. issue here, and there's a social sure. issue here, isn't it, Kim? Because the African-American community has yeah. not necessarily embraced 
uh, homosexuality, gay rights, same-sex marriage. So yeah, how well, do you think this plays in the black community? It's interesting because I, I know that, you know, Glenn Burke, was the, who played for the Dodgers, was the first African-American in sports to say that he was openly gay, but he didn't really want to give, you know, newspapers and press didn't really want to give him a lot of coverage in mm. the 70s because they just weren't ready for that. So technically he was the first. He was the groundbreaker. But, you know, it's interesting because I hear that, that terminology a lot, African-American community and the stigma, but I think it's just a general stigma because, I mean, African-Americans aren't the ones who are denying gays and lesbians their civil rights. I think that it's a stigma all across the board. I don't think that one uh, nationality or race is more or less accepting than the other. I think it's a general stigma and a conversation that is just long overdue. And the community has moved. I mean, once the president came out in favor of gay marriage, if you look at the poll numbers on black support for gay marriage, it totally changed. They're now in the majority. And also, if you look at the response to um, when Frank Ocean came out, mm -hmm. there were tweets sent out by Stevie Wonder. An immediate reaction by other black artists, he retracted that. And the same with Jason Collins when an NFL player sent out a tweet. Amara, I wonder, though, if it was the chicken or the egg. Because mm. you, you know you're tying the uh, the polls of American uh, Black Americans' opinions to gay marriage to the president, but I wonder if he felt emboldened to come out because of the changing attitude, which came first. It all works together, um, and also because President Obama reached out to you know to the gay community during his you know campaign. So I mean he's been an advocate for LGBTQ you know questioning as the new um, terminology I'm told. But I, I applaud President Obama for that. I don't know if our previous president would have done that. And the first lady too. That's and right. First lady, in a big absolutely, way. Absolutely. That's absolutely. Right. Big way. We just have a few seconds left, so let's get to our last topic. And this is a tragic topic, and that is the situation that led to the collapse of the of the factory, the garment factory in in Bangladesh. Jeff, I want to start with you yeah. uh, on this story. Tragic, tragic. And you know, they say up to 400 killed so far. Yeah. 501. And it could be even more. It could be upwards up of to a thousand. thousand. And the worst part is, yes, they arrested the building's owner, but guess what? You'll never see a day in court. It'll, this will go away after a couple of weeks. It's you really typical. think that? It's typical. It's, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to come out of it. I've seen incidents like this back and forth, country to country. Yes, they'll raise a hoo-ha-ha -ha for two, three days, and then everybody goes back to work. That would be a go shame. Go back to normal. Honest, honestly. And you know, it's so interesting. I read this morning that Disney has announced that they're pulling out their business from that area because of these violations of, of labor and... And, and building and, codes. And, and building codes. But, but the, uh, the, the government, the country is saying, no, don't do that. Our economy uh, depends on it. They don't want the companies to leave because they need the business. And so it's... It's really kind of an interesting balancing act. I mean, the, this is the problem with the way that we constructed the global economy. Um, we have made labor, I'm sorry, we've made um, capital really mobile, financial capital really mobile, but the rules are national. So the money's international and the rules are national, and that's ripe for exploitation. And I think from a consumer's perspective, one of the most interesting things to me is that everyone pays. At some point, someone pays. It may look cheap to you and it may be cheap to you, but someone is either pay paying with their life or with their quality of life mm -hmm. on the other end. And so we need to reevaluate as consumers our expectations around cheap and what that means. Yeah, and mm -hmm. look at the people now, about a thousand people by the end of it all paying with their lives. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, well, I guess that's a good place to stop. All right, Kim Kane, thank you so thank much you. for coming. Thanks Mark for Jones, it was nice to meet you. Will, will you guys you. come back? Of course. Sure. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and Little you hesitation. don't go anywhere. <laughs> Little hesitation there. I know she did have to think I about think it. Oh, it's Friday. <laughs> You're watching Arise America.